Hallo und herzlich willkommen hier zum Künstlergespräch bei der Comicjade mal anders. Ich bin der Andi, der Typ, den ihr gegebenenfalls von der ein oder anderen Live-Veranstaltung bereits als Moderator kennt oder vom Podcast der Telestammtisch. Und auch heute habe ich die Gelegenheit, hier jemanden ja, vom Mikro zu begrüßen über das Internet, zugeschaltet einen großen Künstler, mit dem ich schon immer mal sprechen wollte, weil er ganz tolle Arbeit macht und ich bin doch sehr froh, dass er heute da ist. Die comic -Jade findet in diesem Jahr, wie ihr alle wisst, digital statt, das heißt also nicht so ganz so vor Ort in Aachen und ich denke aber schon, dass wir es geschafft haben, in diesem Jahr ein ganz tolles Programm auf die Beine zu stellen, neben ganz tollen auch Signiermöglichkeiten, die es gibt oder eben auch direkt in Aachen vor Ort euch, wenn man so will, ja, auf Distanz Dinge anzuschauen, gibt es auch ein ganz, 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 ganz tolles Online-Programm. Und ich bin wirklich sehr froh, heute jemanden hier zu begrüßen, mit dem ich ab sofort quasi auf Englisch reden werde. Und wie ihr euch das vielleicht vorstellen könnt, ist englische Sprache. Die habe ich ganz viel in der Schule gesprochen, aber es ist nicht perfekt. Für ein tolles Gespräch dieser Art wird es reichen. Und ich bin mir sicher, dass wir hier ja auf eine ganze Menge ganz viele tolle Sachen uns freuen können. Es ist mir eine wahre Freude, heute jemanden begrüßen zu dürfen, den wir, äh, also er ist ein Eiser er hat den Eisen Award gewonnen. Er ist unter anderem auch aktiv im äh, Studio von dem Charles M. Schulz Studio. Was genau das ist und was es mit den Peanuts zu tun hat, wird er uns auch noch sagen. Und vor allem auch wird er uns heute seine äh, eigene Comicreihe Kit Biowolf vorstellen. Ich bin sehr gespannt, was heute passiert. Hello and welcome, Alex E. Fayado. Hello, thank you for, for having me. Excited to be here. It's a great pleasure for me, for the whole German audience, and we are really, very looking forward for this uh, interview. And first of all, how are you? You're somewhere in Santa, Santa, Santa Rosa. Rosa. Santa Rosa. What's up in Santa Rosa? <laughs> so S Santa Rosa is in California. We're just about an hour north of San Francisco. Uh, right now it's beautiful and sunny, and um, and it's actually the home where Charles M. Schultz uh, lives, Uh, or lived, um, and his studio is here in the in the Schultz Museum, and and um, and so it's uh, the place where I where I live currently, since um, part of my life is is at the Charles M. Schultz Studio. So uh, I don't know how you are in Germany for commutes, um, but in the Bay Area they can be awful driving to and from the workplace. Um, mm -hmm. So when I got the job, I moved from San Francisco up to Santa Rosa. Because I didn't want to spend my life in the car. Mm -hmm. uh, this is where I've been for the last 15 years or so, I think. Yes, something like that. My memory is hazy. I've been <laughs> here too long. But it's it's lovely, and I'm in my studio, and I'm, as I said, I'm very happy to to chat with you. So that means you're looking to the sea. Are you you're close to the sea? Aren't you? Yeah, we're not far. There, uh, I could hop into my car and drive. 40 minutes uh and hit uh what we call bodega bay which is which is right leads right to the pacific ocean and it's beautiful um although it, it we're sort of in being in northern california it is colder so you always want to bring a jacket uh it's not <laughs> sunny los angeles and and uh and hot and, and whatnot so um but yeah it's uh it's great and actually i'm hoping tomorrow to to head out that way with my big dog and and enjoy the uh the scenery so yeah and you already told us you're in your studio and maybe that means you're some kind of comic artist <laughs> uh, what does this mean what are you doing especially and um, what are the big things we can know you for um you already mentioned the 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 charts and schultz studio the peanuts maybe you can tell us something about you uh, your work sure yeah well uh i'm a cartoonist and um and uh yeah i i have worked for the charles and schultz studio for uh going on as I said, 15 years or so. But prior to that, I, um, as independent comic artist, um, for a very long time, I did a comic strip that I was trying to get syndicated into, into newspapers. And um, during that time, I actually transitioned to doing a graphic novel series called um, Kid Beowulf, which is, I'm going to show a image of it there. And this is the project that I've been working on for boy, as long as I've been at the studio, if not longer. So I would say maybe 20 years. But those early years... I'm sure you're familiar talking to other artists where they're just trying to figure out like what the story is, how to draw it, how to publish it. So I have um, lots of old and crude drawings of these characters <laughs> uh, as I tried to figure out what the story was. This particular book came out in 2016 and um, it's full color. It's through Andrews McNeil mm -hmm. and um, hope to get it translated into German someday. Um, But I don't know how familiar audiences with the 
the story of Beowulf, if that's a story that um, I know you have the famous hero Sigurd uh, and Sigmund and, and yeah, uh, yeah. the the song of the Nibelung and that, that mm-hmm. like. So Beowulf is sort of of that ilk. And um, the long and the short of it was Beowulf was a big Viking. He went around killing monsters. And one of the monsters he's famous for killing was this man-eating monster named Grendel. Um, and there are dragons and there are other Vikings and their big battles. And, and I read it in high school and I fell in love with the story. Um, and, uh, when I wanted to do comics, I kind of went back to that story because it always sort of had a hold on me. And instead of making Beowulf the, the big Viking, I turned him into a 12 year old and the monster Grendel, who's here in green is his 12 year old twin brother. So I sort of inverted the story and, um, Essentially, it's uh, it's an action adventure story, very much in the vein of of Asterix, which I grew up reading. Yeah, uh, and it follows Beowulf and Grendel across Europe and Asia, where they meet other heroes and get into other adventures. This is the second book in the series called "The Song of Roland," and um, it's based on the French epic um, and has uh, the King Charlemagne and all of his knights. And then the third book, uh, the brothers go to Spain. And it's inspired by the epic poem um, El Cid. So each book is another country, another set of heroes, and Beowulf and Grendel sort of discover a little bit more about themselves and their their place in the world. And and it all leads back to the original epic poem that it's based on. Um, but if uh, people have read things like it, uh, like Asterix or Jeff Smith's Bone or Stan Sakai's Usagi Yojimbo, those are sort of the the comics that I love reading that uh, very much inspired by that. I try to make my comics similar to um, in that grand, you know, uh, world building adventure uh, based fun comics. Great. I have a thousand questions. Oh. <laughs> so, um, first of all, the first thing I heard and um, I thought about when I hit Kid Beowulf and I uh, listened to a lot of podcasts who already sent me some names and, and links and so on. Um, first thing I thought about was an animated film about 10 years old or something like this. Do you know it? And is there any connection between this film and your uh, comic series? No, I think you're talking about uh, Beowulf, the CGI movie that came out. Yeah, it was about... Mm, 10 or 12 years ago by yeah. Robert Zemeckis mm-hmm. who directed it. Um, it's an interesting uh, adaptation and that's actually, you know, uh, mine is an adaptation. It's, 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 and, it, and you, and that's the wonderful thing about these old stories is that people, they're open to everybody to, to play with and to reinterpret and to, and to reignite the imag- imaginations of people who might not be familiar with them. So, in the Beowulf community, of which there is one, there are lots of medievalists out there who study Beowulf or um, much, you know, people who have PhDs, which I do not. Um, that particular movie um, was uh, really derided. Nobody, really, I guess, <laughs> nobody really liked that version. Although, believe it or not, Neil Gaiman did yeah. the script. And, um, oh. yeah, and I thought he did an interesting job because they're, you know, they're in the, in the epic poem, there are some storytelling challenges because it is so old and um, you know, it, it takes the course of Beowulf's full life. And like, how do you encapsulate that into like a two hour movie? Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the problems is between act um, two and three, there's like a 50 year gap. So after Beowulf in the original kills Grendel and in mm-hmm. turn kills Grendel's mother, he goes back home and he's a King for like 50 years nothing really happens. And then a dragon comes out of nowhere and starts to terrorize his homeland. So he has to go out as an old man one more time and, and kill the dragon. And in lots of different adaptations, there's this, you know, people often like leave that part out or they're not really sure how to reconcile that. How do you connect those two things together? And what Neil Gaiman did, which I thought was really interesting is that he, he connected all three, um, uh, Grendel, his mother and the dragon. Uh, and in fact, in that version, the dragon is Beowulf's son that he had with Grendel's mother, who was played by Angelina Jolie. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember that. Uh-huh. So anyway, she, she seduced him. And then 50 years later, um, the, the baby they had is this dragon that comes to terrorize the homeland. So I thought that was interesting because it was very similar to what I did with my story in that, you know, the familial connection of Beowulf and Grendel was twin brothers. Um, And in my universe, the dragon is actually their grandfather. So 
I guess that's a long way of me saying uh, Neil Gaiman and I were on the same page. So <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> um, so it's just like a template or something. Uh, I'm sorry. And the 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 whole bio will setting is just like a template or something. Can you say? Yeah, it? yeah. Hmm? It's it's you know it's one of those stories that that uh, gets told and retold and, and adapted. Yeah. And um, and so that's that's kind of my point of view is because I love that old story and I love Greek and Roman mythology and Norse mythology and all these old epics. And I feel like to a certain de degree, they're kind of like the original superheroes. Mm -hmm. um, and so many young readers are just not familiar with these names. So it's also a way for me to play with these stories and then also introduce these old heroes to a whole readership that might not be familiar with them. And maybe if I'm lucky, get them inspired enough to read the original. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, for me, I love, I love just digging into those stories and, and uh, seeing all the connective tissue because in that world mythology and, and, um, uh, and ultimately just trying to tell a good story. Yeah, later on, we will go uh, into the characters. You will show us how to draw them. You will, we will switch the camera and so on. And uh, I'm very happy that you, we have the chance to see how you do it. But first of all, let's talk about the audience. You said your series is called Kid Beowulf. And you're talking about the audience. I think it's a, it's a younger audience. There's this kid spin. Maybe you can tell us who is the audience? Who is this series made for? Uh, I would say it's for... In the States, we call them middle grade readers, which is sort of like... Um, Eight-year-olds to 12-year-olds, that's kind of the the, mm -hmm. the target audience. Um, but And that's what the publishers and the booksellers use. Um, yeah. Truthfully, for me, it's like it's it's an all-ages audience. It's the same, it's for the same audience that uh, when I grew up reading Asterix and Bone and, mm -hmm. and as I said, Usagi Ojimbo, that's that's the same. The Saturday morning cartoon kind of, yeah. of approach. Um, and at the same time, I've had adults read it. And enjoy it and people who teach beowulf in college have used it in their course so it, it you know i think um like a lot of good material um it's my hope is that it transcends age and if you want a good story you can read it the same way that you know you grew up reading peanuts and we still read it today and we still enjoy it so it's it um uh I, that's that's my hope at least so Is there are there different levels of humor of deepness and so on for every um, age for every age group? Can you say it like this? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, for instance, um, one of the characters I don't know if you can see him right there. Yeah, a little pig. So his name is Hama the pig, and um, he is Beowulf and Grendel's stalwart companion. He's sort of like R two D two. He follows them on all of their adventures, and he doesn't speak. Um, and so. Uh, but he's very smart, um, and it gives. And he's a character that gives me an opportunity to do a lot of pantomime. For instance, if I want to just uh, wordless panels, so a lot of action-driven stuff of like Hama getting out of, um, you know, escaping from a pig pen or trying to, you know, uh, get away from a butcher or things like that. So, and that's all just visual humor. And I think that sort of thing appeals to a younger audience. Um, at the same time. I'm doing sort of jokes and gags that are referencing the original Beowulf that really only perhaps a, a scholar would get. And then um, in between all that is just, like I said, that story that, that hits on all those action adventure fun um, cylinders for your average reader. So I'm trying to work on a number of, of levels. Yeah. <laughs> for me, ultimately it's just like writing a good story, getting better at my artwork and hoping that, um, it appeals to people. Yeah, thank you. I had a chance to look at your artwork. You gave me a short um, excerpt of the of the German version, a private yeah. made indie German version. I really liked it. It's um, it's funny, just <laughs> funny. I liked it, <laughs> and I want to read more of it. And I think I'll get the chance um, somehow, uh, some when I don't know when. Um, and I would like the English version too. I think loads of German comic readers do read international, especially English, um, uh, the English language comics, English comics, yeah. And uh, I really hope there will be a chance to get them right here. But first of all, you already told us that your characters are uh, moving to different um Sp uh, different different uh, regions like uh, you, you talked about pa Paris, Rome, Rome, Doctor Rome. I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, and, actually, um, finished is Rome. Is it? 
possible that you can use your comics for uh, as a, for teachers in, in schools, like historic lessons and so on? Oh, Is there yeah. a chance to use them and why? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's a great, great point. Um, at the end of every book, I do this kind of extended, um, what we call, it's kind of a glossary. And I have um, essays, ah. and, uh, you know, character descriptions, and just sort of um, material that talks about the original source material. And that's intended for people who are curious about that source material and for teachers who might be using this in class. And we've, we've done teacher's guides that have been used um, in classrooms where, you know, if the classroom has read the book, you can spur discussion. Um, and I've heard some really good feedback from, from those classes. Sometimes I'll go to a school and I'll give a talk and introduce them to you know my work and and the mythology and i'll get back like a, a big stack of like great thank you letters all written from these from these students who um who enjoyed it and and uh and the teachers talk about how they use it in their classroom so there's definitely a component mm -hmm. to that um that i um intentionally kind of do but i don't but again it's not about making the stories um lectures yeah know, yeah, yeah. Like, like hopefully it's entertainment uh, yeah exactly yeah. yeah first and foremost it's it's entertainment and um uh and then secondly is all that stuff that you can you can glean from it that that might, might i can imagine it's it's a good starter for comic readers you get to know the comic medium for example in the history lessons and uh you get to know your your series and afterwards you start reading a lot of more stars a lot of more stuff yeah yeah well yeah. actually for for me so the first comic I remember being given um, where I was like really aware of like, like, what is this? I want to know what this is and I want to learn how to draw whatever this is was Asterix, the legionary. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that was, you know, Asterix is all about Gaul and fighting and the, and Julius Caesar and the Romans. And so there was already like a historical component in Asterix that I found really appealing Uh, which I think kind of led me to the actual history of of that time. Um, and so that's always something that stuck with me. Um, and there's, you know, I try to infuse that in, in my own work. Um, I'll tell you, a few years ago, I was lucky enough to visit Germany. Mm -hmm. And I went to the Frankfurt Book Fair. Mm -hmm. um, I was there for, for, for peanut stuff, uh, where we met a lot of our publishers. And then I took some time and just traveled around uh, different parts of Germany, made my way to Aachen. Mm -hmm. uh, which was really cool because in the second book, The Song of Roland, as I said, Charlemagne was a, was a big um, character in that. And in my research, you know, his, one of his places where he uh, ruled from was Aachen. So it was really cool to go to Aachen to, to see all the, the different things that I was, you know, researching and drawing like right in front of me. That was so cool. I loved it. And that's what I, and that's what I love about, you know, when I go to Spain or France or Italy uh, or Greece or other, other places like the history, you guys are so lucky. The history is all there mm -hmm. and it's, it's right in front of you. You can, you know, uh, I get so excited when I go to Europe um, because I love um, just everything that Europe is uh, and comes from. And, those mixing of cultures and, and, um, the stories. And so that's what really inspires me. So whenever, every time, anytime I can get a chance to go, I do, because I know that will be a direct, um, influence on my work. Yeah. And we are hoping to, um, welcome you here, welcome you here pretty soon again. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's of course, Europe is a place of history, but, uh, let's be honest, uh, everywhere in the world is a lot of history, especially in the, uh, America too. Yes. Uh, yeah, the, but the good old Europe is maybe a good, uh, a starter for historic stuff like, you, um, yeah. If you like swords and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, castles and such, Europe's, yeah. a, good, Europe's a good spot. <laughs> so yeah, we're, it's, yeah, we have lots of castles up here, especially in Germany. But right. I think, no, yeah, everywhere. Um, how many books are already out there of your series? Yeah, so I have, um, there, are th there are three. Uh -huh. um, you can see them all. Uh, this is book one. And then that's called The Bloodbound Oath. Uh, book two is The Song of Roland. And book three 
is the rise of El Cid. These are about like they're each about 200, 200 pages or so. Mm -hmm. And do then, you have a publisher or do you publish it by your own? This is published through a, an American publisher named Andrews McNeil. Yeah. Um, and uh, and yeah, and I'd, I would love to get it translated into into German and every other language. Yeah. That yeah. Um, so which is partly why I did that excerpt that I sent yeah. you that sort of showed like, hey, it can work in, a, in another language. Um, so always open to those conversations. And then the fourth book, I actually just finished that. And this is a kind of a, a galley. Um, mm. This one takes place uh, in Rome. It's actually about the founding of Rome. It's mm. called the Tarpeian Rock. And it's about uh, twin brothers, uh, Romulus and Remus. And then Beowulf and Grendel get thrown in the mix um, in sort of a gladiator style mashup. Um, and this one will be out in August. So I'm just sort of doing the final edits on that. Um, and uh, that one I'm really pleased with. I think every book I get a little better and um, uh, it's just exciting to, to finally finish something you've been working on for a couple of years and, and get it out into the world. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Please tell me what's your secret. How does it work out? There are different um, times. The, um, um, the stories are said are yeah. happening. Um, how does it work out? I think there are, hundreds of years a gap between yes. different uh, uh, times how does it work out so um yeah that's a great question i guess the way that i rationalize it is um the the country that beowulf and grendel happen to be going to ha is whatever time period of that epic poetry they're sort of it's not as if they're going through like a literal portal that takes mm. them to another time they just like They cross borders and they happen to be, for instance, in France during the time of Charlemagne, because that's the source material, the Song of Roland. That's 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 the time period that it happened. When they cross into Spain, they're they're moving into the time of El Cid, even though that took the you know the difference between those is, as you say, a couple of hundred years. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't really linger on it too much. It's really just like whatever country they're moving into happens to be the uh the new place where they're where they're diving into and if you're and if as a reader you're okay that i've made beowulf and grendel twin brothers mm -hmm. and you know there's a talking dragon and there's a pig <laughs> yeah. things i think people would be okay with it's fun of course <laughs> um yeah for sure and so for instance you know as you say now they're going to the founding of rome which is even uh you know maybe 500 years after uh or i'm sure before what happened in book three so yeah it's a huge leap mm -hmm. um but uh i don't dwell on it too much and and hopefully the reader shouldn't either um and uh and i guess i would say the superstructure of the story is that for every country that beowulf and grendel go to they get a little bit older and they slowly learn what their true destiny is it At destiny is which is to fight each other which is in the original epic poem mm -hmm. so you know the deeper that grendel who's the monster goes into these mythological places um the more he becomes he feels more like a monster and he can't really control himself and for beowulf the more that he goes into these places the more he realizes he's a strong fighter he's really good at fighting monsters and oh his brother happens to be one what does that mean and it's kind of the idea of like um fighting and fighting against one's destiny and and what is choice and fate and all those big those big mythological questions that i like to play with in the guise of an action adventure comic yeah so, yeah uh, as far as i can see it you do the colors you do the outlines you do the story you do everything it seems like to be a one-man show is it uh it's 90 percent. i do have a colorist his yeah. name is flores and he does a marvelous job of bringing the book to life for a long time i did it in black and white um and then when i found a publisher they wanted to do it in color so i found um jose and honestly i i he really kind of just takes it up a notch mm -hmm. and um makes the art look even better um from my chicken scratches so uh he's really a big a big part of the team um mm -hmm. he's based in the philippines believe it or not mm -hmm. and and we we've only ever worked through email so what happens mm -hmm. is I'll, i'll finish a bunch of pages i'll scan them in the computer I'll send them to Jose and he'll do like a first pass, just kind of like plopping in color. Um, and then he'll send it back to me and I'll kind of tighten it up, um, you know, make sure everything's on model. 
And then I send that back to him. And then he sends me the final pages with the shading and the effects. And it's uh, every time I get a page from him, it's like Christmas morning. Cause it's just like, Oh, yeah. it's great. So uh, <laughs> I yeah. really think so. It's a, uh, it's a surprise. An everyday morning surprise. Exactly. You, you, you say, um, You're scanning your pages and send uh, the, ma uh, the mails to, to him. Mm -hmm. That means you are not working digital. No, no. I work, um, this is actually uh, one of the pages. Yeah. And this is from the, this is the opening page of book four. Mm -hmm. uh, you can hear it's a, I work on 11 by 14 Bristol board. And I don't know if you can see it. There's really yeah, yeah. Some, some, a big, I, I was really proud. This is a funny story. I was really proud of inking this page. This book, I wanted to use um, brush and and pen nib, like my heroes, like Jeff Smith. And this page like took me a couple hours. And like I sit back and I look at it, and I make a real rookie move, and the 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 bottle of ink um, spilled on the page. <laughs> I just spent like hours doing it, so I had to like go and put in the white out and fix it. Um, but uh, yeah, I do as much as on the page as possible, um, and then I scan it into the computer um clean it up uh and then so colors and the word balloons are all done digitally in photoshop mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um yeah i have a lot of friends who use cintiq or even their ipads procreate to draw yeah and um and for me it's it's a lot of this uh i mean if you can't tell i love like old classic stuff so all of my heroes drew on paper It's hard enough to get it to look good on paper. I can't imagine trying to get it to draw on glass. <laughs> I've tried it before. It just it just doesn't work for me. So, yeah, okay. and it's really thrilling when you get like a massive stack of Bristol board that mm -hmm. shows the work that you've done, as opposed to like yeah. little pixels. Yeah, I get But, it. Okay. Yeah. Um, in one of the podcasts I listened to, you were talking about web comics and doing things online and social media and so on. And I think the podcast was some years old. How does it work out? Are you um, how's your Instagram account right now? <laughs> I don't think it's much better than it was. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, but yeah, I encourage all of your um, uh, listeners and to to follow me if they'd like. Uh, of course. And uh, I'm at Lex Fajardo Art both Twitter and Instagram. Um, and, uh, and I post a few times a week, you know, just showing process stuff. Um, and, uh, and that's been, that's been fun. Uh, I try not to take the social media too seriously. It's just, um, it's, you know, for some people it works really well and for others, it's just, um, it's just a frustrating thing. So for me, it's frustrating. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I do also do a web comic. Um, so, so your readers can read it online. Um, and on my website, kidbeowulf.com, I have links. Uh, I actually just started to post the, um, the story on Webtoon. I don't mm -hmm. know if you guys have yeah. Webtoon. And that's interesting because it's, um, it's ideal for a mobile device. So you can just sort of scroll mm -hmm. up. Um, and that's been interesting because I've had to basically cut up the comic because, you know, it's made for as I showed you, it's a, you know, a yeah. larger format. So I have to, to make sure it fits nicely on a screen. Um, so I'm always just trying to get the, the book out there, the, 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 whether it's online or in book form or, or what have you, because um, you can always get more readers. And um, can we support you and your work on Patreon or something? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. I also have a Patreon page. Yeah. Um, I think you were to search my name, it would come up uh, uh -huh. again, Lex or Alexis Fajardo. Um, and that's actually where I released book four, this one all online, um, for my Patreon backers. Um, mm -hmm. so they got a sneak peek of the book and I did, uh, weekly updates, uh, through 2020 and it's all archived there. Um, and so that's oh, great. Where great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, so all of my new material, I, I, I kind of show exclusively on Patreon. Um, and, uh, it's really good to have those supporters because you know making comics takes a long time uh and it's hard um as much fun as it is it's hard to do good comics um or any comics it doesn't matter mm -hmm. just like it's just a, a challenging thing so when you have fans who support your work um and are engaged and and, and want to see you succeed it, it it makes it a lot easier 
Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, before we get back to your characters in Cat Beowulf, because you will switch the camera. First of all, let's have a little part and talk about Charles and Schulz, the studio of and the Peanuts. And I think there are lots of people out there, especially from the Comic Yada, that of course know everything about the Peanuts. But to be honest, I don't know that much. We have in Germany um, new comics of the Peanuts. I think the newest stuff is released here on a German publisher called CrossCult. And yeah. I'm not that fami familiar with their um, actual published books. But maybe you can tell us something about um, the whole the whole business behind it. Because I'm not, I'm not familiar with the studio idea, with the Charles M. Schulz business what what is it um how does it work out and um he's the the the, the inventor of the peanuts isn't he wasn't yeah he? <laughs> yeah charles m schultz um mm -hmm. creator and cartoonist of uh the comic strip peanuts mm -hmm. he started it in 1950 and um he did it for 50 years the last strip was published in 2000 um he was the only person to write draw ink the uh the comic strip um it follows the adventures of of snoopy who is uh mm -hmm. the the dog and his best friend charlie brown and they're kind of misfit characters in a very american suburban uh world of you know um post-war america mm -hmm. um and uh and it's a it's a really interesting chronicle because it's 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 kind of a story about schultz Uh, he he would always talk about if you wanted to get to know him as a person, mm -hmm. just read the comic strip, um, because he put everything that he was in those characters: his anxieties, mm -hmm. his um, his hopes, his uh, his failures. They all existed in that comic strip, and so you know you could read the comic from 1950 um, to 2000, which I think that tally is like 17,000 odd strips somewhere in that neighborhood and you get a sense of who the man was um and uh and I've been fortunate enough to to love peanuts since I was a kid like when I literally when I was eating my cheerios I would read peanuts in the newspaper and and one of the reasons I wanted to be a cartoonist was because I love Snoopy and Charlie Brown those were like my first drawings yeah um so in america um Snoopy and, and, and Charlie Brown and, and Lucy and Linus and the, all of them, um, they're, they're like, they're household names. Um, and, uh, so it's really exciting to hear that in Germany, they're very popular too, and actually across the world. So what happened was that, you know, Charles M. Schultz did this really popular comic strip and, um, it kind of took on a life of its own because, you know, when it became really popular, I would say like in the early sixties, um, people wanted to have t-shirts with Charlie Brown. They wanted to have mm -hmm. mugs with Snoopy. You know, they, they had been doing books for a little while and those books were, were very popular, but um, suddenly there was this appetite to have Snoopy on all kinds of different things. This is actually a pencil sharpener from Japan. Uh -huh. like Snoopy on there. <laughs> this is a ruler that I also have. Oh, okay. I, uh, I have a lot of, you can tell I have a lot of stationary stuff. Uh -huh. Snoopy there. So, you know, out of the popularity of the strip grew an appetite for the product because, you know, we're all comic fans. I mean, you're wearing a, a Batman baseball cap. We love mm -hmm. to sort of have the things of the, of the, of the characters we love um, to own a little piece of them. Um, so Schultz, his real focus was the comic strip. He just wanted to do his work. Um, but he's also a good businessman and he knows that, that, um, well, if, If, there, if there's a popularity, if there's a desire for this, well, that, let's figure out how to do it the best way. So he um, created a studio called Creative Associates. This came about, like, I think 1970 or so, where he had a staff that basically would work with um, the syndicate, which was based in New York. And the syndicate was basically the, uh, the company that sold the comic strip to all the different newspapers. And they also made business deals for T-shirts and and mugs and whatnot and he really wanted to make sure that whatever had snoopy or charlie brown on it looked really good because he you know he took pride in his work and he wanted to make he doesn't want to make cheap stuff so he put together a studio um that's based here in santa rosa and their prime objective was to ensure the integrity of the comic strip 
and his characters as it was transmogrified, as it was transformed into these other products. Um, and so um, that's what the studio did. Uh, and actually, when, when Charles M. Schultz passed away in 2000, here's a crazy story. So uh, Schultz's nickname is Sparky. Mm -hmm. um, all his best friends call him Sparky. Every Actually, we at the studio call him Sparky because... You know, that's just sort of the vernacular. I was yeah. never lucky enough to meet the man, but oh. you read all his work and and you work with it day in, day out. You just sort of become as part of your, your vocabulary. So, um, uh, and he was named Sparky because at two days old, uh, an uncle, when he was first introduced to to his nephew, said, oh, he looks, he looks like Sparkplug from this comic strip called Gar Barney Google. And mm -hmm. Sparkplug was the name of this racehorse. And it was really popular, like in 1922, when, when Schultz was born. And so he was named, he was nicknamed after a comic strip character. And throughout Schultz's life, the one thing he loved more than anything were comic strips. He would read them with his father. He knew from the get-go he wanted to be a cartoonist. He's nicknamed after a comic strip. So that's sort of something he carried with him his entire life. And on the day that his last comic strip was published, February 13th, 2000, he had, he had actually, by that point, already said that he was going to retire because his health was failing. He couldn't continue to do the strip. So um, the last strip was slated to run on a, it was going to be a Sunday. Uh, and it ran on February 13th. And he died in his sleep the, oh. the day that his final strip went. Oh. To I mean, if that is, you couldn't write a story yeah. that kind of, that, that anyone would, would believe. But, it, but I think it just, it reinforces the idea that this was a fellow who was devoted to his work. Like that was his lifeblood. Um, and so it's, it's one of those things just working at the studio that I always kind of marvel at. Um, and so, and I started at the studio in 2007 and, uh, and my purview there is really working with publishing, with publications. Uh, as you said, that there's peanuts in Germany. We have publishers, uh, in France and Spain, all across the world, Japan. Mm -hmm. And they always, they're always like, you know, publishing different editions of, of peanuts. So one of my jobs is to work with those publishers to make sure that they do, um, beautiful editions of, of the book and, and, um, and I have some other responsibilities, but I get, I'm really lucky that I get to, to work with, you know, that printed material. Yeah. And, um, and I get to, you know, as a cartoonist myself, that's the thing I love the most is just like digging into all the stuff that he created. Um, and so those, the, the publisher that you mentioned cross cult, yeah. uh, we've been working with them for a couple of years and they recently took on a, the task of adapting some of the comic book work that we've done. So this is a comic book that the, um, the studio put together through boom studios. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're based in Los Angeles and these are just a couple of the issues. Um, and so what we did for about 10 years or so, we would take a lot of Schultz's stories um, and adapt them for more of a, of a comic book um, yeah. ah, okay. audience. And we would always put in original Schultz material too. Um, but we would just sort of expand on some of his different storylines, kind of working them into the comic book page. Yeah. Um, and so those are collected, and CrossCult has been been publishing those those collections. Um, they've also been publishing. I don't know if you've seen this one, but it's a graphic novel adaptation of a animated story, or I'm sorry, animated movie, Race for Your Life, Charlie Brown. This mm -hmm. one came out a couple of years ago. Beautiful artwork. Yeah, it's artist by uh, Robert Pope, who is also going to be a guest, um, virtual guest uh -huh. uh, for Comicade, and. Um, and so one of my jobs is to work with people like Robert and work with the writer uh, who was part of our studio, Jason Cooper, and kind of come up with different storylines featuring um, the Peanuts characters. This is uh, one that we came out with last year called Snoopy, the Beagle of Mars. And in this one, this is really fun because, uh, you know, Snoopy crash lands on what he thinks is Mars. Um, and it's a really fun story. Um and you know Charlie Brown, the gang is in there too. But this one isn't based on an um, original strip from Charles, isn't it? From no, Sparky. no. The, this, is, this is an original story that yeah. Jason came up with. Okay. Uh, 
And uh, so that's that's the other thing. It's like we we adapt and then some of the original stuff from the comic strips. And then in cases where we have a really strong story, we'll create something new. Um, and the third book, I don't have a, a preview of it, but I'll be out this spring. It's called Scotland Bound, Charlie Brown. Mm-hmm. And that's written by Jason Cooper with um, art by Robert Pope. Um, and that one's really interesting because it's based on an old storyboard that Schultz did with his animation director, Bill Melendez, mm-hmm. back like in the late 90s. Um, so we had these storyboards at, at, at the office and they never materialized into an animated film. But we've all, often thought like, oh, it'd be kind of cool like if we could adapt that into a graphic novel, kind of like get the story out there. So that's what we did. Um, and it's really fun. And Charlie Brown and Snoopy and Schroeder and Linus and Lucy end up going to Scotland um, and uh, hijinks ensue. So that'll be out this spring and probably the translated edition from Cross Cult hopefully will be out, you know, uh, within the year. So it's very interesting that there are so many differences, for example, to um, Calvin and Hobbes. Um, I know there's not, it's not, not even possible to get some official merch from it, but um, the Peanuts um, do have lots of stuff as far as I can see. Um, are there still daily or weekly um, 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 strips uh, from, from the Peanuts or do we have the, the, the bigger ones, the comics, the graphic novels and so on? No, the strip is still being published. There, yeah. It's all the reprints. So, so oh. you know, one of the... Um, one of the mandates, so to speak, when, when Schultz passed away is that nobody would uh, do the comic strip anymore. The four panel oh. comic strip like this. Yeah. Just, um, so, uh, but there was the window of doing comic book adaptations like this. Um, it's a, it's, you know, it's a fine line, obviously, but um, part of the idea was to, um, to, you know, try this publishing program to, to get peanuts back into kids hands yeah. again and and um but the the comic strip itself that's sort of sacrosanct and um and it is uh available to read online at yeah. you know, peanuts.com and in the newspapers and um and also in these in these in these books uh, i think you can actually follow i think it's at snoopy grams mm-hmm. um on instagram and um and at snoopy on twitter um, and we'll always like post different snippets of yeah. art. Um, so, and, and, and it's, you know, we just launched the Snoopy show on Apple plus, yeah. um, which is a new animated series featuring uh, Snoopy. Two ones, aren't they? Two shows, uh, Snoopy in space or something yeah. and a uh, usual show. Yeah. yeah. So Snoopy in space, uh, it's sort of like a mini series and it has mm-hmm. kind of an educational bent. So th- the idea was, um, Peanuts has had a long relationship with NASA and um, for all the new things that NASA is doing, going to Mars, like the Mars rover, things like that. They wanted to, um, to just kind of get kids excited about science again. So we did this, this, you know, I think it's like a six part mini series of Snoopy in space. Um, and then the Snoopy show just launched a, uh, a couple of months ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's more of a traditional, you know, the kids are in the neighborhood and, um, very similar to the to the um original animated material from the 60s so sparky would love the uh, modern graphic novels and modern comics would he i think so yeah. yeah i mean you know he what's interesting is that he loved comics um mm-hmm. granted like i'm i'm only speaking from what i've learned uh from what i've read about him but you know he wasn't afraid of innovation he wasn't you know he That's the thing, like he he wanted to fulfill the desires of his fan base and like create, you know, the opportunities to have a Snoopy t-shirt or or a book. Like he um uh I think he was open to different ideas. So uh the graphic novels, I think um he get a kick out of. Um he'd probably maybe want to draw them himself. I, I I don't know. But um, you know, one thing we always joke about, you know, like for these books it takes 10 of us to do what one man did, you know? Yeah, so, yeah I get it. <laughs> we never, we we're never, um, we never feel like we can ever do anything better because he did it the best. And so we just want to, um, do as good a job as we can and, um, you know, get people turned on to peanuts and read the original source material because it's, 
it is so good. It is so fun. Um, you know, before we started to chat, I was leafing through one of these old comic books and I came across this Sunday um, strip and just sort of like reading, reading them um, and reminding myself of just how good they are. And I don't know how many baseball fans there are in Germany, but let me see if I can find it. The strip is, here it is. So it's a Sunday strip. Yeah. And it's Lucy on the ball yeah. field and she's going up to Charlie Brown and she said, Hey, Charlie Brown, some kid left his glove on the, on the baseball field. Um, we should try and get it back to him. He was really smart. He put his name in the baseball glove. See, his name is Willie Mays. And she's going on like, I don't, I don't know about if I've met Willie. I'm not familiar with his name. Do you know who Willie Mays is? And then Charles, and then, you know, Charlie Brown's like, look in your glove. There's a name in your glove. And she looks at her glove and, she, and it says Babe Ruth. And she says, yeah, I don't know Babe Ruth either. I like it. So it's just, you know, <laughs> yeah, one of these yeah. very funny um, comics that, you know, I've, I've read them all, but I can always reread them because they're just always so funny. And um, he was just such a good writer. Like that only works with Lucy and Charlie Brown. Um, Cause Lucy is just, she's a horrible baseball player and, <laughs> and she just doesn't really care to be there. And you can sort of just get a sense of like, she, she doesn't even know who some of the base, best baseball players are. Um, and uh, so it's really just fun. It's, I'm really lucky and fortunate to be associated with the Schultz studio and get to like read these comics and work with them every day. So um, I, I'm not that much into this trips game, but um, are comic strips still a thing? In, in in US America? <laughs> yeah. That's a great great question. Um, uh they're on okay, comic strips and newspapers, the way that yeah. we're we're familiar with them for our generation, are not. Mm -hmm. They're sort of on the uh they're kind of a dying art form. Had that but that's to say um in newspapers. I have a lot of friends who are cartoonists, but you know, the advent of social media, Instagram, Twitter, yeah. like yeah perfect venue for a comic strip web comics are huge um but i think the challenge nowadays is is to find the audience the way that you could with a newspaper yeah, um, okay and there have been a lot of cartoonists who are very successful at that those ones that we mentioned before who are like really good at instagram which mm -hmm. i'm not yeah, yeah. <laughs> they can make a living from from that um I'm and more power too. you know it's great yeah uh, okay thank you Two questions left before we switch camera. And um, first of all, and I had I listened to one of these. I already talking about these podcasts, but there was one one very interesting fact about a wall, a wall of strips inside the studio. Maybe you could tell us something about the, the wall, uh, something we can walk through a museum or something like this. Uh, what is it? Can you the, tell us something about it? Are you talking about? Was it at the museum, perhaps? Yeah, maybe like, like yeah. All of strips. Uh, 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 as far as I imagined it, and uh, from the from the podcast, it was a wall full of the original yeah. strips. So, yeah. What is so it? In, so in the so here in Santa Rosa, hmm? um, there's a studio that I work out of, and uh, there's also the Charles M. Schultz Museum, which was built. I think it broke. I think it, it um, maybe early 2000s it was built, um, and that's the place where fans of Peanuts can go and see Schultz's original artwork on display. And they do a lot of um, exhibitions throughout the year. We actually opened uh, Snoopy Museum Tokyo, which is kind of like an official sister museum in, in Tokyo, Japan, that has similar exhibitions. They're both beautiful places. What's really cool is when you walk into the museum here in Santa Rosa, you walk into what's called the Great Hall. And at the far end of the hall is this massive, I think it's like a 50-foot wall, you know, top to bottom, maybe even taller. Um, and there's a mosaic of Charlie Brown kicking the football being held by, by Lucy, that famous kind of image of him running to, to kick it. And it's, and it looks like it's pixelated when you, when you like, as if it were like a eight bit art, but as you get closer, you realize that this mosaic is made out of thousands of small comic strips that have been printed on ceramic tiles. And this artist, this Japanese artist, um, basically created a mosaic of all these strips. Uh, and, and out of that strip, you can see that, that image. 
Um, so that's really cool. What's even crazier is that that one wall represents one year, I'm sorry, one decade of comic strips. Mm -hmm. So if you're to take Schultz's whole output, you know, the five decades that he worked on peanuts, it'd be five of those giant walls. You know, that's, that's like how much stuff he produced. Um, and that's, what's always startling to me is that, that he, you know, every day he went to a studio and he did another comic strip and, and, you know, he did so many, yeah, yeah. Cover up, you know, <laughs> giant wall of, of comics. So it's just, uh, it's just amazing. Um, his output and his dedication. Um, so I agree. Is, is the museum still opened up actually is the for your audience. Can we go there? Well, actually you can do they, they've been starting to do virtual online. Oh. Tour. So I would, yeah, I would check out schultzmuseum.org. Um, and you can, you can kind of see the museum if you're not, If you're not lucky enough to visit in person, you can see it online and it, it will be opening up shortly once we get through COVID. Um, yeah, and it's a beautiful, awesome. beautiful place. I mean, if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, it's definitely worth a pilgrimage just an hour north to check it out. Um, and because I think comic fans will really love it. Uh, I remember actually, as I said before, when I went to Frankfurt and then Aachen, I made a detour to the Hergé Museum um in i think it was in in belgium and it's a beautiful place and I, and i'm a big fan of tintin and it reminded me a lot of the schultz museum because mm -hmm. uh it has that same kind of quality where you can just kind of walk into the comic strip world that that they created so i highly recommend it if you're if you're a fan of peanuts it's worth going there great I, I'm absolutely i'm absolutely sure we will do and i will do <laughs> <laughs> Um, so last question to you, the studio work. I'm here at the official blog of the peanutstudio.com and they say you're the editorial director. Does this mean you're the head of everything? <laughs> Maybe this question is a bit late, for, but tell me what's exactly your job there. <laughs> yeah, so um, so in terms of publishing, I mean, it, yeah, I'm sort of, uh, my eyeballs go on every piece of, of um uh publishing that's produced whether it's here in the states or where you guys are in germany or off in japan um i just review all those those things and make sure that they're done well um and i'm lucky enough to work with a lot of great publishers across the world creating peanuts books i have another thing to show you guys which we're really proud of this book came out um earlier this year Ooh. called the peanuts book And there actually is a German edition of this available. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is a book that I got to work on with a um, uh, great writer. And it's kind of just a walk through Peanuts and from, and you know, it gives you character, um, you know, biographies and a look at Schultz's, Schultz's work, how he, how he created sort of the, some of the iconic things. There's a, there's a really fun spread here. I can see if I can find it. Um, actually, well, since we're talking about his workspace, this is, um, this is his uh, studio workspace. And what's cool is the museum recreated this area. So you could go to the museum and see uh, a recreation of, of Schultz's studio. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's a great look at just how he created Peanuts. I have another spread I think is really interesting to share um if i can find it uh we talked about all those strips and you know how he did them all daily where is it uh we we put this spread in the uh in the book which is great because you just see me flipping through pages <laughs> but i do have it <laughs> um Uh, this is not the one uh, you won the Eisner Award for, is it? Isn't it? It's another one you for celebrating Snoopy in 2018. Do you have yeah. this one there too? This one is um, I don't know. I think we submitted this one for an Eisner. I think it's definitely mm -hmm. worth an Eisner. The uh, we did a we put a lot of work into this one. Um, and where is that page? Now it's not going to be worth it if I can't find it. Um, 
I can. I know what's in here. Um, sorry. The one that that won the Eisner Award, I have here too. And yeah, this is really fun for your viewers. <laughs> um, like a screensaver. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here it is. Okay. So we did this spread. It's called From the Drawing Board. I don't know if you can see that, but it yeah. kind of gives you an idea. This is a close approximation of how large Schultz drew. So this, 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 you know, this, this double page spread, it has, it, the comic strip is actually a little bigger, but it's, what's cool is that this is a scan from the museum and you can kind of get some of the detail. Um, you can sign it, you can see the paste up, you can see some of the pencil lines below it. Um, so anyway, I, that was a, this book sort of has that kind of behind the scenes stuff to it that I think is really, again, if you're a big Peanuts fan, it's worth it to you. And the book you mentioned before, the one that did win the Eisner Award was this one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Celebrating Snoopy. And it came out in 2018. And it's, you can see it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. heavy. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a, it makes a really good doorstop. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this one is just a collection of, of strips. Um, and we worked on this with, with the whole studio. So, you know, some of my, um, colleagues, we just kind of read through the entire library and chose the best, best of Snoopy, so to speak from 1950, all the way to 19, um, or actually to 2000. And, um, the stuff that, um, so they're sort of collating all that material. And then the stuff that I'm really particularly proud of are these sort of opening chapter essays yeah. that kind of dig into a lot of the stuff we've talked about. Um, you know, Schultz's craft, his thought process, his, his, his artwork. Did you that, write them? Yeah. Yeah. So huh. this is the material that I, that I wrote. Um, and, um, and this was really fun to write because it kind of encapsulated just my own take on, on mm -hmm. the, the work. Um, and hopefully if, when, you know, when you read this and you read, the other material it's it's enlightening and you can get you know some more insight in, into peanuts um so yeah this this one for best archival collection um and it was a big studio win because everybody really chipped in and, and did their best work on this and like i said it's it's super thick and heavy <laughs> so um yeah great yeah Good. thank you good. very much for assuring us um all this in very interesting stuff. Now I think this is the moment we can go directly to your drawing board, and oh, sure. maybe we can change um, the camera. You got an, you have got another device on your right, and yeah. now you can activate it. And we, I think we can go back to Kid Beowulf, don't we? Yeah. Let me turn off my camera. Or would you like me to keep mine on? Hmm. No, we can see you on the other one too. I'm just hoping that we see this camera in the video. <laughs> But I'm sure it will. Um, I will turn off my camera just to be sure we just see the right camera. Maybe you can turn off your uh, second camera too, or the first camera. Can you say th something, please? Mm -hmm. uh, there you are, yeah. Okay, sorry about that. <clears throat> okay, what do you want to show us? Maybe you, some character stuff or your, your work, working on, the, on your uh, comic series. Tell me what will you show us? Yeah, so hang on. Just had to get the glare out so you can see that. Okay, so I just wanted to show um, the. Sorry, is the is, you can hear me? Okay, I can hear you, and I can see the second camera. It's perfect. Okay, great. So these are some pages from the new book that I just finished. I thought um, I'm a process junkie, and you might have viewers out there who love to see how comics are made too. So I thought I would just like walk through um, 
just how I draw those those pages. So this is the opening to book four. And I draw everything on 11 by 14 Bristol board. Uh, you can see the red pencil beneath. A lot of cartoonists and animators uh, will use different colored pencils, um, usually blue or red. Um, I'm gonna see if I can find, uh, or I don't have it with me, but I used red on this one. Um, uh, and what happens is once I ink the page and I ink with different um, pens, this is one of my favorite Japanese brush pens. Mm -hmm. It's called, a, I think the only English word on here is zebra. <laughs> So it's a zebra pen. I have a couple of these different ones. Uh, there are no English words on this one, but they're beautiful. They're really nice pen nibs. Um, so I like to use those. And I also use uh, Windsor Newton sable haired brush, which all of my, all of my heroes uses. Jeff Smith uses this while Kelly uses this. These are really hard to master. Um, so I'm still trying to figure it out. It'll take all, take all my life. Um, but it's, uh, I don't know if you've talked to other creators, but the idea of, of, of inking is so, is so much fun because, you know, the, the drawing is really hard to do <laughs> like the blocking, you know, and how do you, where do you put the balloons? Um, so when I get through all of that, when I scratch out the, uh, the pacing and the, and the, and the spacing, then I can spend time and just put on a podcast and start to ink. Mm -hmm. And that's my favorite part. So these are just sort of a glimpse of, of some of those pages and what they look like. Uh, the opening of this story, as you can see here, Beowulf and Grendel, um, they're in these fighting pits in, uh, in ancient Rome. And they'll, part of their journey is to become these, these great gladiators. Uh, and so here they're, this is the opening scene where you can see that they're, they're pretty good at, at fighting. Uh, do you um, do can get us any closer? I think we can see most of it, but it's not that sharp. The other camera was oh, a bit sure. sharper. Um, I think we can uh, see the most of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this this was a just a fun um, sequence to, to put together, and um, so just a glimpse of of just how some of those pages are are done. Let me see if I can get a little closer <clears throat> and then i thought maybe i would just draw some of the characters oh yeah this. we'll see if this shows up um on the camera so i'm gonna draw uh Beowulf. i i start everything with with an underdrawing and I'm going to do this really quickly so you guys can. You're working with your pencil. Lots of other artists are working with blue pencils. Uh, you aren't, are you? I normally do, but for the camera, I'm just going to use graphite because I mm -hmm. think it shows up a little bit better. So you can see there's a, here's a really rough uh, outline. That's going to be his head, torso, legs, arms, and and he's going to be waving to the camera. I'll give him his sword, too. Um, so actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go right to pen. And we'll see if this. And I'm sure probably a lot of your astute comic fan um, podcast listeners will see that where my influences come from. As I said, I was a big fan of Asterix. Mm -hmm. I really liked Jeff Smith's Bone. And then, you know, Charles Schultz and Peanuts. Do you miss all the comic events, all the fairs, all the live yes. drawings? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Uh, it's interesting because I think the pandemic, you know, living through COVID myself and so many of my 
cartoonist friends, we're inherently introverts. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we like to, to be in our studios drawing, um, putting on our headphones and just, you know, diving in. But those, um, those events, those comic events, uh, events and, and conventions, that's the time where we get to see each other. We get to crawl out of our caves and say hello. <laughs> and we need those um, to keep our sanity. <laughs> so to see the sun again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I'm definitely looking forward to going back on the road, seeing my friends, meeting my fans and you know, just saying, you know, welcome back. It's nice to, to see him again. Um, and especially this year, because book four will, will be coming out later this mm -hmm. summer. So I am hoping that, you know, baby, by the time that rolls around, we'll be back to somewhat normal. What was your last event, coming event? What the f uh, that's a, so here, there's Beowulf, and you can see. Oh, yeah. Really quick sketch. He's going to say one of his favorite phrases is holy Loki. <laughs> and Loki is, of course, the, the Norse god of mischief. Yeah, yeah. Um, my last comic event. That's a good question. I think it was, um, it might have been Comic Con, actually. Mm -hmm. New York is, or San Diego? Uh, yeah, San Diego Comic Con, yeah. which, uh, Great. If, if again, if you have the opportunity to to go to Comic Con, I highly recommend it. It's it's kind of a once in a lifetime thing to go to. It's massive, and um, just just loads of fun because I get to see. Yeah, as far as I can see it, there's never if you if you are there, there's never enough time to see everything you want to see. No. <laughs> there's so much stuff, so much people, so yeah. much comic stuff, especially. <laughs> yeah and they do a really good job i mean yeah there's lots of hollywood stuff yeah clear. but there is uh, which is exciting um all those panels but they also do a really good job so here i've just sketched out um Hama the pig wow and we'll ink him yeah. in uh but what's nice about um comic-con is that they also do a really good job of keeping it focused on comics mm -hmm. and not too many com conventions these days do that well enough you know they, it's always about the celebrities and and the panels and and you know going walking down artist alley or small press is my favorite thing to do when i go to uh, san diego comic-con and i have friends who i used to exhibit there pretty regularly now i sort of just go as a fan um, but I still have friends who are, you know, uh, in the trenches, um, selling their books at, uh, Comic-Con and it's great to see them. And I, I've found that for my material, as much as I love comic conventions, I do a little better at like library shows or teacher conventions, just because mm -hmm. I think the material that I do is, is, is suited to that. Mm -hmm. Um, But every now and then I make sure to just go to the show for for fun because I didn't get that. <laughs> There's Siri. She wanted to be part of the conversations here. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Siri. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, anyway, so there's so there's Hama and there's Beowulf. And do we have time for I can I can squeeze Grendel in there if you think we have time. Oh yeah, okay. That's it's okay. He's not going to be exactly proportional because he's a little taller than Beowulf, but I've run out of paper here, so he's going to do my best to squeeze him in. I'm so jealous of your talent. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice of you to say. I will say um, this is like, it's just like years and years of just drawing. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, being in school and drawing in the margins of my notebooks and, and scraps of paper and, and whatnot. So. Do you have any advice for starters for starting illustrators? Well, maybe just that, just, you know, draw all the time, 
Um, you know, there's 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 nothing wrong if you have particular artists who you're a big fan of. Like, for instance, if you love Jim Lee's work, mm -hmm. um, it's okay to look and and copy some of those styles. And because because what you'll do is you'll learn uh, just different techniques from those artists and what what worked, what didn't, and then what works for you and what doesn't as you try to adapt those styles. Because eventually you'll arrive at a, you know, a, a style that, that works for you, that conveys the best story and character that you're, that you're interested in telling those stories about. So, you know, again, I grew up reading Asterix in my early comics, very much have an Asterix influence. And it took me a while to sort of learn to shed those influences and, and, and just kind of figure out how to draw uh, my own way. But that's not to say that I didn't learn a lot from seeing how those masters did it. Um, I think there's, there's definitely a, a fear that people don't, you know, they don't want to copy and, and I totally get that. But you also, you learn by, by doing and by emulating those styles that, that you're um, influenced by. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. <clears throat> I think all the great comic book artists would say like they were influenced by Jack Kirby and they took, they took mm -hmm. those, those, those great things that Kirby did and, and injected them into their own work. Same like with dots. <laughs> What's that? Like dots. <laughs> oh my gosh. The Kirby. The yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's why those guys are the masters, you know, we can't, mm -hmm. we can't be as good as the masters, but we can certainly try to emulate them. So there's Grendel. Awesome. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Should I put the camera. I'm pretty sure lots of the people here on Comic Yarde Mal Anders would really like to get this piece of art. <laughs> And is there any chance to get um, anything, any of your original art for, uh, to, to, to uh, do you sell it? Yeah, actually, I, um, you're gonna, I'm gonna turn this one off and turn this one on. Yeah. Let's see if you're there. Okay. So, yes, uh, I on my website kidbeowulf.com, There's there's a, an area where you can go and um, order books, and in that store, I also sell sketches. You know, like this. Um, I don't sell any original pages, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I haven't quite figured out if i want to do that yet i mean i have a i have a stack of them i have like you know uh, yeah, but... pages of original art but um but maybe someday i'll sell them i don't know for, for now i like to do little character sketches and you and i have them for for sale um and i, I could do requests too if so if somebody wanted a specific character mm -hmm. I, would, i would do it kind of like the idea of of those comic shows where you go to an artist alley and you want a, a commission so i i do those as well All right, so the last question for today is the question for recommendations. Do you have any recommendations for books, comics, movies, or whatever, or especially uh, for uh, maybe podcasts or something like this? Uh, do you have any recommendations for the reading audience and listening audience out there? Um, well, in terms of podcasts, if you're, if you're not tired of listening to me right now and you want to <laughs> listen to more... <laughs> Uh, you can go to, and if you want to listen to, to more about Peanuts uh, and Charles Schultz, there's a great podcast I recommend called Blockhead. Um, and a friend of mine hosts that, and he talks about uh, Schultz's influence on comic strips, and, and, and that's a really fun podcast. I, I've been a guest on there. Another fun podcast I like to listen to that I've been a guest on, but um, I really enjoy when I'm, when I'm drawing because there are these two guys who are also cartoonists and they just talk about craft and how to get better at it. And whether you're making web comics or graphic novels or what have you, they always offer really good advice. And that one's called comic lab mm -hmm. LAB. Those are both on Apple to iTunes or, um, you know, other podcast places. Um, so I highly recommend those. And in terms of books, Oh man, this is where I always get tripped up because there are so many books to recommend. <laughs> Um, let me see, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of far away from 
my bookshelf. Um, well, I mentioned it before, I mentioned it again. They're actually right here at my side because I always like to look at them for, for inspiration. But yeah, this, Bowen, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Good one. This one, too, is so much fun. This is the Great Cow Race. Uh, and these are his original black and white versions uh but i mean if you want to learn how to be a good cartoonist just read anything jeff smith does and mm -hmm. you'll and you'll have a leg up um another fun I, fun one that i had right here uh was uh, asterix um this one's asterix in spain they have so many they actually have been doing new editions too mm -hmm. um with a new creative team which i've been interested to see uh, and they're doing a really good job. It's kind of similar to what we've been doing with Peanuts in that you have the, you know, the original creators are no longer with us, yeah. but carrying on. Um, so I've enjoyed uh, rereading uh, Asterix. Um, and then, oh, hang on. I have a great comic I'll show you. Das ist der Moment, wo wir mal in den Hintergrund gucken können, was hat der Künstler bei sich im Regal stehen. <lacht> All right, so this one you could probably find. This is in in French. Ah. I found the the English version on Comicsology. They recently translated it. Uh, I think it's called The Swordsman in English. Um, but this beautiful uh, book by Xavier Dorison and Joel Parnot, I think. I hope I'm not mispronouncing his name. Uh, and granted, this is all in French, so I had to download the English version to understand. But, I mean, it's just beautiful stuff. Just amazing. Um, and it's, and I think the storyline is just like this old master of arms, this guy right here, who um, has to basically bodyguard this this kid who has a message for the for the king, and he's and they're you know tracked through snow and these these beautiful yeah i've been playing a lot of assassin's creed valhalla recently oh. so this book kind of transports me into that that land perfectly <laughs> it's just perfect yeah it's beautiful so those are some books i would recommend um and uh and yeah i mean if, if any of your in readers are interested in learning where they can find my own uh there's my website and then book four as i said comes out later this year and um i might be doing a kickstarter for it i don't know we'll figure out um how to get people across the world that that you know the the option to to pre-order the book so um mm -hmm. but i'm um excited to get that out there and then and then uh keep doing more stories great and we are very looking forward for this story. So we uh, hope we will see you soon here again in Germany. I hope we will get maybe a German version of Kid Beer Wolf. Uh, this would be great. And Lex, I really, really thank you for your time, for this interview. I just hope we can do something like this again. Maybe have a drink or something like this. Um, thank you very, very much. Thank you, man. This was a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.